Hey, welcome to the Inward Investing Podcast. I'm Mike Ritter. And I'm Todd Whalen. And we have an awesome guest today. And he is <laughs> he is joining us from all the way across the world, Marty Kendall, the founder of Nutrient Optimizer. Welcome, Marty. Dude, yeah, from the future. Great to be here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> what is it like in the future? Oh, the irony of being Marty Kendall from the future, if anybody's seen Back to the Future. But anyway, no, it's, it's awesome. You'll have to catch up. <laughs> yes, awesome. We'll go over like all of the all of the sports betting information we need to know. <laughs> That'd be great. Great idea. As soon as we get off the air, though, so that no one else gets it, we want to capitalize on this. Um, so, like I said, you have a website called Nutrient Optimizer, and yep. some people may be familiar with that, and some yep. people, maybe they don't. But before we get into, uh, I think, the meat of this conversation, tell us a little bit about your background. I know you're an engineer. You, yep. uh, let's, how did you get into this? And maybe you don't yeah. have to go all the way back to childhood, but, you know, well, <laughs> what's your path um, yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose uh, civil engineer by day, like to use numbers, and I, I tend to like people go, well, yeah, why do you use graphs? And I just sort of see things in graphs and want to optimize things and and um, with with numbers and charts. And um, my wife was telling the story yesterday. Uh, our daughter's fifteen, and today, and um, when she was born, going back to the very start, um, I was graphing her contractions and saying, okay, now the next. Con- Contraction should be here, and we're projecting when the baby's going to be born. But uh, anyway, that, and that that was all part of it. My wife is a type one diabetic, and um, and that's sort of the, the major impetus to go. Okay, I can see how food influences her life, her quality of life, her blood sugars, her insulin requirements. How do I quantify that to try and optimize her quality of life through what she eats? So that was part of it. I came across the food insulin index and um, tried to manipulate that to say these are the foods that hey you should eat more of and these are the foods you should eat less of. Then got to the point where hey that the, the food insulin index leads you to very high fat foods to stabilize blood sugars, which is the whole low carb keto thing, which is good for some people, but for myself, who's trying to lose weight and and uh, you know be be more muscular and, and leaner ideally uh, as we all probably want to do eating a whole lot of fat bombs all day to, to keep your blood sugar stable isn't ideal. And I suppose it's been a journey since then over the last five years or so trying to find that optimal point for different people with different goals. So some people are trying to do therapeutic ketosis, some people are trying to get lean and jacked and some people are trying to um, put on a lot of weight and some people are trying to stabilize their blood sugars. And um, through all of that, they need to optimize the nutrient density so that they get satiated and they're energized and the mitochondria work more effectively and they can think and perform a whole lot better. So that's sort of the, the journey is to continue to, to refine a system to help people find their unique nutritional approach for, to suit their goals. So that, that's been the journey. That, that's the thing that wakes me up really early every morning and um, I try to quantify that. And recently we've developed the, the Nutrient Optimizer, which is a tool that helps people get into that, that, that channel, that funnel and say, how do they move that forward for them to achieve their goal? Now there's, I think there's a big difference between, you know, wanting to help your wife or being very inquisitive yourself Mm. versus taking the step to create a website to help other people. What was the, what drove you to do that? Yeah, I suppose initially it was like, I think I'm onto something here. I've got to share it. I've got to write it down. And as an engineer, you sort of write it down. And as you as you put it in writing, you go, okay, I understand it. It makes sense as a, as a thesis by itself. And then I got it out there and people liked it. And, you know, you get the dopamine hit from people reading it and giving you a good reassurance. And that just keeps on going. So I've just been, you know, I really love developing ideas around nutrition quantitatively. And, and sharing them and getting them out there to make people think. And that, and that a lot of the people that I really like and respect out there have um, resonated with that and uh, really reacted well. And that gives me a lot of a lot of buzz. But then the next step is how do I take it out there to uh, to share it with the greater world, the wider world, who you know don't spend their days and nights dreaming about nutrition and how to optimize it and how to improve things and. Uh, uh, I suppose I've got a bit of an anger and a bit of a frustration that people like my wife get such crap nutritional advice for so long that if she'd only known that 30 years ago, what would her quality of life have been able to be 
I suppose there's a bit of there's a bit of an anger and a frustration to you know how can we make this uh, you know uh, accessible for the whole world so that they can actually if they want to improve their nutrition to feel better and perform better how can they do that in a in a in a simple way that doesn't have, they don't have to. They can dive into the deep end, but they don't have to. So yeah, that's the journey. That's the challenge each day to try and simplify it and make it more accessible. When did you realize you were really onto something? Was there a uh, point where this it just really clicked? Yeah. Like, hey, this this could really be something that I can create a career out of. Uh, yeah, oh, well, I'm not sure about the career thing yet. To be honest. <laughs> I definitely spend a lot of time each each day, each uh, in all my spare time, developing it. But yeah, it was like um, one. I think it was about five years ago. I came across um, Jason Fong, who was talking about the food insulin index and how that influenced things. And I dug back into the original research that looked at the food insulin index, and then. I'd been getting into um, Matt Lalonde, who was talking about nutrient density, and sort of, I went, "Wow, this food insulin index is really important to help people like my wife, and to help uh, identify which foods are best and worst, and then to join that it, using multi-criteria analysis to to optimize it with nutrient density." I went, "Wow, this is <laughs> why hasn't anybody else thought of this?" And oh my god, I I think this is really important, and I'm going to get it out there so yeah that, that was sort of a bit of a moment back then i was like trying to jump up and down and say to my wife i think i've found something really important here i was like okay cool i think this could be a really big deal and yeah five years later it, it has resonated with a lot of people and um when we do implement it it works perfectly as designed so it's like oh this is, this is so good yeah I, I you know it's really easy to use when somebody like me who can barely read can understand it and, <laughs> and actually get something out of it. And, you know, it being halfway across the world, I mean, I, I can only hope that, Oh, whatever I'm developing has an influence to people, yeah. you know, around the world. So I, I'm sure that has to be really cool, mm. but there has to be, obviously it, it's a great website and I want to dig into the website a little bit here, but mm. it's a great website. It's easy to use, but ex- Tell me how the, this has helped your wife. What have you seen specifically with her story that's helped her the most? Yeah, oh, just more and more as we, as we took the journey um, into uh, low carb keto, and, and, and there's pros and cons of all of that. But uh, and, and paleo, uh, just her energy levels, her ability to rather than just uh, you know, she's a teacher by day, trained teacher, but then you know, all different aspects of type 1 diabetes, the anxiety, the, the fatigue, the, you know, everything that comes with the, the fluctuations, the massive fluctuations of blood sugar, um, you know, leave her, you know, she'd try to drop the kids off at, at school and come home and do a bit of work around the house and then nap for the afternoon till she could uh, get up and go back and pick up the kids and she was, you know, not living life to her full potential and um, really quite exhausted. But as we've been able to dial it in more and more and more, she's just had so much more energy and vitality in life and seen her personality come through more and more and, you know, all the complications that were starting to show and typically show with type 1 diabetes of living elevated blood sugars all the time that have continued to improve more and more and more and I saw it's really good and she doesn't have any complications and um, blood sugar and HbA1c is fantastic so um, you know she doesn't have perfect energy all the time but you know it's probably 90 95 percent most of the time and can live a really full life with the family and yeah she's thriving and it's really exciting and that that's reward enough in and of mm-hmm. itself but um, I suppose once you see that in your own family um, trying to get it out there to share it with the world is, is the next step and uh, yeah what was some of the dietary advice she was getting uh, I suppose it was just eat whatever you want to eat what everybody else is eating and then just inject to do that and um, and Dr. Bernstein talks about the law of small numbers and uh, basically small inputs um, in terms of food requires smaller inputs in terms of insulin. So um, you just can't match in a normal healthy person with a working pancreas, let alone someone who's injecting um, exogenous insulin. You can't match that incoming food requirement for insulin with the actual insulin, insulin you're injecting. So um, the higher the carb 
And to some extent, the protein bolus is that the harder it is to manage those blood sugar swings. So by manipulating diet, you can stabilize the blood sugar swings, which just enables you to much more accurately nail the the, the insulin dosing and uh, get a much better blood sugar response. So, yeah. What was what was the big turning point for her? What, what year was that? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it's been a bit of a journey probably over the last seven years or so as I've got more and more into this. But um, there was a point where we, we met a friend, Troy Stapleton, in Brisbane at a low-carb conference, and um, he talked about this type 1 grit group um, based on the ideas of, uh, of Dr. Bernstein. And we joined that and we just saw these type ones with amazingly stable blood sugars and these flatline blood sugars. And it's like, wow, this is, this is a real thing. These kids are really thriving and doing incredibly well. Maybe I can do it. And she just launched into it more and more. And um, yeah, joined me, joined me in the journey and, and believed it more when you see a thousand other people doing really, really, really well. And uh, we've made a lot of friends through that. And it's been great to see, to be able to contribute to that community that we've enjoyed a lot of benefit from as well. So you're telling me that somebody with type one diabetes isn't just slave to injecting themselves with insulin and just dealing with the consequences for the rest of their life. They don't have to be. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be massively debilitating. I mean, she's um, 42 now and she, she, you know, as someone who, when I met her, she was like, Oh, I don't think I live past 50 because that's the prognosis. But now it's like, you know, (laughs) <laughs> the sky's the limit at the moment, which is really, uh, really encouraging. Yeah. That's amazing. Awesome. Mm. That's amazing. So I'm sure there's somebody out there listening to our sh- show right now that is knows somebody who's dealing with it. I don't remember what the stats are, but you know, in the United States, um, we even have uh, skyrocketing, skyrocketing numbers with type two diabetics mm. in the adolescent age, childhood mm. age, mm. Um, I, I, if I remember correctly, the stats of type, type two diabetics are like one in five now in the United States, mm. one in eight, maybe, um, mm. far more than it used to be. And, you know, type two diabetes is definitely manageable. Type one, I think is new news for a lot of people. Mm. Um, because you know, it's the heredit. I think people have just kind of rested on the fact that it's hereditary and there's not much you can do about it. So that's mm. incredibly hopeful for, you know, a lot of people that, mm maybe don't think it has anything to do with their lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. I suppose to add on to that, though, that, um, you know, keto and uh, low-carb and eating fat bombs, I found through, you know, trial and error in my own, my own errors, um, it's not the be-all and end-all for everybody and, and keeping insulin low. Uh, you know, insulin is a two-edged sword and the more body fat you have, the more insulin you, you need to produce to hold back that body fat and storage. So to keep to just load up with fat bombs was the other end of this, the, 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 the edge of the thing. So taking, you know, the journey with keto gains and, and that sort of crowd and, and understanding that, uh, you know, if your goal is fat loss, then just trying to stabilize blood sugar is not ideal. So there's sort of been a, where I mentioned earlier, a bit of a differentiation between what's your goal and then how do you dial in your nutrient nutrition for that. And, uh, you know, you can do it to the nth degree or you can, give people food lists and, and, and meal lists of meals that will suit that, that bucket, we call it, that, that, that will suit a, a particular individual with their individual goals. So, yeah. And I know that's why you created the website. And so let's mm. talk about that itself. So when somebody, when somebody gets into the nutrient optimizer, they're going to go in, they're going to start a profile. Yep. And what happens from there? Yeah, I suppose there's there's, um, there's an optimizingnutrition.com website, which is where I've, you know, developed my ideas and sort of put them out there, basically trying to get feedback and and spread the word and get the ideas out there. And they're the the long form blog posts that go into a fair bit of detail. But then we've tried to develop the nutrient optimizer, which is a tool that uh, you, you jump in there. And you can do a free report, which gives you your um, your macro ranges. So your, your minimum protein and potentially upper limit of carbs and fat gives you, hey, based on your current eating pattern, uh, these are the nutrients you're probably not getting enough of. 
And here are the foods that will then complement that and the meals that will complement that. So we give people a, a starting point on that journey. And, uh, yeah, then in the background, we've run a, f- a couple of challenges so far where we have uh, we did a weight loss challenge in January and a nutrient density challenge in May where we uh, gave people like, the full-blown tool, which is this massive suite of, of nutritional tools that we've, de- we've developed uh, that just guide people through the implementation of that in together with Chronometer to help um, – help them optimize nutrition from a, a bottom-up level based on the micronutrient density. And right now, I think I saw on your website recently that you've collected over 600,000 daily food blogs. Yeah, we, um, we came across there's two, two sets of data. One was MyFitnessPal where we, uh, we, we got this database of half a million MyFitnessPal uh, food logs that enabled us to dig into satiety to look at what it is about food, different parameters of food, um, protein, fat, carbs, salt was what we're able to get out of that to say what helps people to uh, to dial in how much they eat and you can quantify satiety. So for someone trying to eat less, they can do this and for someone trying to eat more, they can you know, manipulate their diet like this. But um, then with all the people uploading their data from Chronometer, which tracks micronutrients, we've got 25,000 days worth of people, a whole 8,000 people tracking their micronutrients, which then enables us to look at which micronutrients tend to be related to eating more or eating less. So, yeah, that that's just, I'm really thrilled about that, to be able to dig into that and say, okay, it's, it's potassium, magnesium, sodium, cholesterol help you to actually be satisfied more with the food you eat and tend to eat less. So I think that's the, the next frontier in nutrition to, um, to dial in your micronutrient density to help you be more satisfied with the food you eat so you don't need more to get the protein and potassium and sodium that you need from the food you're eating. Yeah, and I, I think the school of thought out there, at least over the last couple, I don't know, couple decades has been as long as it fits your macros – bro yeah. or uh <laughs> you know go keto or you know like it's all been macros for the last 20 years or so yeah. at least as far as popular culture goes so yeah totally I, I know to you know although this might sound like common sense like the foods that you eat matters <laughs> but this is revolutionary news to some people yeah, yeah I'm, I'm completely thrilled i suppose on, on, on the good thing about if it fits your macro is it gives you a minimum protein target uh, about 25 percent. so for most people if they're getting 25 percent from of calories from protein versus the 12 percent, which is average that's going to be a massive improvement in satiety and when it comes to keto it gets you out of that gray zone of carb plus fat that we've found that you know a uh, low protein plus moderate carb and moderate fat together is just the the formula for hyper palatable autumnal foods that drive you to eat more and just gorge. So um, if you can reverse engineer that, uh, it, you get out of that gray zone. So I think that's where keto low carb works for a lot of people. They get out of that middle zone, but then they often swing to the other end where, you know, the more fat you eat, you know, that, sounds really seductive to say just eat fat to satiety, but fat and satiety, are, you know, once you separate fat from protein is an oxymoron, you know, you're drinking your olive oil and butter and MCT oil in hopes of losing, losing body fat is, is a fool's errand effectively. What's the, what's the biggest pitfall or maybe that's it. What's the biggest pitfall <laughs> with, with keto? Yeah. 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 With, cause I know keto is, it's being, I mean that's the that's the hot stuff right now, and yeah, what's um, the big yeah, pitfall there? Uh, our analysis showed that once you get more than fifty, sixty percent of your calories from from fat, you start to find it easier to overeat. So, that, which which is fine if you're an athlete, if you're doing a lot of activity, um, you need energy from somewhere. So, a very high satiety, high nutrient density diet will um, drive you to eat less, and you won't be able to overeat and for someone like myself trying to you know, lift weights regularly and, and for someone who's very active, you need to get your energy from somewhere. So you don't want to have a, a super satiating, super nutrient-dense diet all the time because you need enough energy to recover. Um, 
but a lot of people just have this magical belief in high fat and ketones will make them lose weight. And if I just chug the butter and MCT oil and exogenous ketones and drive my ketones high enough, um, I'll be losing weight because I've got ketones. But that, that's probably the, the big pitfall there is that just because you've um, jammed a whole lot of extra energy into your system from all those different um, energy sources, you're not going to lose it from your body fat. It, it's really working it the other way. And a, a lot of people, the more we've gone into keto, uh, you know, you find even the Verta work, um, their, their ketones went from like, 0.5 up, uh, no, 0.3 initially up to 0.6 and then a few months later they were back at 0.5 and they, they've stayed at 0.5 in the in the two-year follow-up and we see that more and more people adapt to a keto diet they oxidize fat more efficiently and they they, they drop the ketones and they the body learns to use ketones efficiently and effectively so so chasing that number on the ketone stick or the, or the blood ketones is, is just a um, probably a waste of time and a real distraction for most people. I think it, it, you, you'll find once you start to lose weight, you'll up your ketones and anybody goes, oh, I know what to do with this and I'll, you'll burn it, you'll be satiated, but um, you don't need to keep chasing the number on, on the stick and probably the blood sugar is probably a much more useful indicator of your energy status uh, and maybe blood sugar and ketones together. If you can bring that, we call it the total energy, back further down towards, you know, six, five, you know, even four, if, if your addition of your blood sugar and ketones together is, is really low, you're going to be losing weight because you've got such a low amount of energy in your bloodstream and you'll have to use your body fat. Well, I, I, is there a difference between what you've seen between the keto you're describing and then also supplementing electrolytes along with that mm. because I noticed that you, you, you mentioned potassium as one major player mm. and mm, definitely. Should, is, is that kind of a key player there? So if somebody's doing keto and yeah. you know, they're hitting maybe some of these symptoms that you're talking about, is that, is that yeah, a yeah. big issue? Yeah. I mean, keto flu is really just electrolyte depletion generally in the early stages of a, of a keto diet because you're cutting out carbohydrates and people think, oh, need to cut my carbs right down so I cut out all vegetable matter and all of a sudden they, they've got no electrolytes from potassium, magnesium, sodium, calcium, which are really the big ones. Um, vitamins and minerals are much smaller and typically easier to get in adequate quantities. It's typically the, the potassium, magnesium, as I said, calcium, the big players and amazingly in, in the um, in the recent analysis of um, the, the, the chronometer data that the effect of potassium people are obviously just really low in potassium in the default diet um, they say I think about two percent of people are naturally get enough potassium in the default diet um, so the more foods you eat contain potassium you get this massive reaction to satiety as you improve that but we don't seem to have a real strong taste for potassium like we do for sodium. So the food manufacturers never really put it in food. Um, we just get it from green uh, leafy veggies, which are um, often, you know, not, not often consumed and um, especially by the carnivore tribe, which is a, another, you know, fad diet type approach that works for a lot of people. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting out there and trying to, trying to navigate, trying to, I'm trying to move on from, you know, belief in a, a named diet or, a, or a, you know, people believe rather than deities in, in diets now. They, they have this magical attribution of the ability of diet to, to save me if I'm part of this group or that group or whatever you want to call your diet. But, you know, we, 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 we can move on beyond that to actually look at the things that actually change how much we eat and how satiated we are and how, what helps us, you know, feed our mitochondria and, uh, you know, build muscle and, and, and lose fat. So yeah, that, uh, hopefully hoping to be part of a, an exciting new phase in nutrition. Well, I, one thing I've really appreciated about your approach and I, I will say like, I have to admit that, uh, a bias interview is not always like the most fun interview to listen to, you know, I, this, be devil's advocate. Yeah. Be, because I'm, you know, because I'm already, I'm already a big advocate of what you do, but I will say that the reason 
why I really wanted you to come on the show. And the reason why I wanted mm-hmm. to talk to you and the reason I'm a big fan of what you're doing is that you've always had this approach of, at least the tone of your content is, mm. I collected some data. Mm. This is what I found. <laughs> and this is, you know, th- this is what I'm seeing. Yeah. And rather than opinion first. And so if anybody's going to your blog, they are going to see a lot of charts. They are going to see mm. a lot of line graphs. And based on what you've seen, what are some of the most common problems coming through? Or I shouldn't say most common problems coming through, but what, what are you seeing as far as the surprises over the last five years of your, in your observations? What have you learned the most, the things that stick out the most mm. in your um, observation of the way people eat? Yeah, I, I suppose people's approach to nutrition, like I was sort of inferring before, is really often based on, you know, I'm plant-based, I'm vegan, or I'm carnivore, I'm keto. And like the amazing thing that all of those pr- approaches that work, if you're more, if you're extreme enough, what they exclude is, you know, refined flours, um, really refined isolated sugars and refined vegetable oils. And the more I've dug into into that area, you just see that, you know, back in 1910, we learned to extract uh, vegetable oils using solvents from soybeans, canola, rapeseed. And then in 1930s, we learned to, um, to harness nitrogen and inject it in through fertilizers into our crops. So all of a sudden, we didn't need to rest our soils, involve animals in the development and fertilization of those soils. And we can just keep grinding that same plot over and over and over again. So you get this really nutrient depleted soil that's fueled with, you know, refined fat, uh, sorry, just chemical fertilizers that, that grows crops really quickly and then grows humans really quickly. And then we've managed to smash the refined starch and refined oils together into mass processed food that um, is just the ultimate growth food for humans that mimics the autumnal um, foods that are really available in a short period of time each year to help us get fat in preparation for winter. Um, so if, if there was one thing you'd say to people, you know, what's the one thing you should do is next time you go to the shops, don't put anything in your shopping cart that contains some sort of combination of refined starch, refined oil that has a whole lot of colours and flavours to make it look nutritious because, you know, it's not and it's not going to help you. So, you know, the problem is you, you'll be left going, what can I put in my shopping cart? Everything in the shops is is full of this stuff and, and that's, that's our problem. We've got to find a way to... Um, I suppose the nutrient optimizer hopes to cut through the BS to say, you know, I know the marketing says it's this, this, and this, and this, but, you know, what actual micronutrients does that contain that you need and, um, you know, help you isolate and identify foods that will help you thrive? Well, and if I'm, if I'm shopping and I, I put a, you know, I get a box and it says fortified with vitamin A, fortified with vitamin E, I, there's, there is an element, you know, reading mm. through some research myself, there's an element of when you supplement a nutrient mm. or it's fortified into another food that doesn't typically take it, there's research to show that you don't always see the nutrient status in the body mm. actually change. And sometimes mm. that has to do with like enzymes in food, bacteria, mm. a little bit of magic that we just don't understand about <laughs> organic matter. Do you have any insight into that as to why, you know, real food and the nutrient status of real food will typically prove to be better than that in processed food fortified with vitamins and... and Yeah, fascinating, fascinating, fascinating area that I've been trying to dig into and understand more myself recently. But um, uh, yeah, wow. So uh, I think at a fundamental level, you've, you've got the... Um, the, the the animal digestion that you know then produces manure that goes into the soil and makes the soil this thriving ecosystem that goes into the plant that then goes into your stomach and all those things sort of um, come into you that, that that aren't contained when your food is just this um, developed mainly from from chemical fertilizers with a bunch of fortified um, supplements on top of that. But then, you know, the, 
everything is so synergistic that um, it's not just the one nutrient, it's not just the, the B9 or the B12 or, or the vitamin A, it's all of those nutrients working together synergistically and, you know, so, so much of the time it seems to be the foods, that's the whole foods that really provide the benefit rather than just one isolated supplement and, you know, if, if you've got, you know, you take all these calcium supplements but you don't have the vitamin D from the sun that you need, you're not going to put them in the right place. They're not going to go to your bones. They're going to go into your, 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 your um, cause atherosclerosis from um, building up in, in your blood vessels. And there's all these sort of examples. I mean, if you if you take a, you know two tablespoons of salt that might, what you need from your food each day, you're going to be running straight to the uh, the bathroom because it just goes straight through and all these minerals aren't, you know, your body's not used to absorbing this massive dump of minerals into your gut that you tend to see in fortified foods or, or the supplements. Um, and, and, you know, if, if you know, the stories of, you know, you, you overdrive the folate pathway and your, your folic acid is not the same as your your, your folate that's found in real food and that can that can um, mask b12 deficiencies and all these sorts of things and so many stories of you know it, getting your nutrients from whole real food is you know the first point of call maybe if you want to top up a little bit to reach um, the rdas or, or optimal levels which are typically a good chunk higher um go for it, but you've really got to make an effort if, if you want to see real health improvements to get your nutrients from real whole food that were, you know, ideally grown in a, in a more traditional way, um, not just mass farmed, mass cropped with uh, rel- heavy reliance on, on chemical fertilisers, nice. which and is really hard these days. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Everything is processed that we get in stores. Um, so now with your uh, website and all the people that you've, you know, that have gone on your website and done the nutrient yep. optimizer. What are some of the results that you're seeing from these people? Like, yeah, yeah, put in everything. Like, what are their comments back to you? What are some of the the results that you're seeing? Yeah, it has honestly been a thrill just to see that that the challenges and people really thriving with it. We did one in in January where we focused on weight loss because everybody's into that and mm-hmm. diabetes management and their their blood sugars came down. Um, I forgot what the rate of weight loss was, but it was like one and a half percent a week of weight loss if, if you dial it all in. Wow. But it's not just the it, it, it's the um, <laughs> it's the lack of cravings and the energy levels that you seem to see once you focus on nutrient density and satiety. Um, if you can actually quantify the the satiety of your food and say, well, these are the meals that will work best if you're trying to maximise satiety. Um, that was what we saw in the, in the, in the January one and people were just not hungry and they, they had, had their breakfast, had their omelette or whatever they had and um, not hungry till way later in the afternoon and they're just going, this is different for me. This is really radically different and new and um, I'm, I'm losing weight with lots of energy. I suppose that was the important thing. Once you get the, the nutrients yeah. in your food, your body, I think restricting calories just through sheer willpower and, and tracking and weighing is one thing. But to to prioritise nutrient density, um, uh, you give your body what it needs and your body goes, okay, I've got enough food, I've got the energy, I've got the nutrients I need, I'm not going to crave more. I think you're, um, you seem to get much less metabolic slowdown in that process and your body isn't craving and crying out for more nutrients. It says, well, I've got the nutrients I need from the food and I've got the energy I need from the fat on my body, I'm, I'm good, thanks very much. And um once we saw people dial in their micronutrient profile, that was really amazing too because we said, okay, on the second challenge, we don't want people to worry about tracking calories. We just want to track your micronutrient status. Mm-hmm. And, and again, it was like incredibly satiated, um, got to a point where they're just they're getting down to 1,800 calories just because they couldn't get this food in because it was so bulky and satiating and, and their appetite was really low and the energy levels were still very high, um, which was, yeah, just a real thrill. And I suppose that's that's the extreme. Um, and for most people, they're going to find that balance point of, you know, let's get that nutrition, the nutrient density, and let's get that first fundamental cornerstone, that building block. And then, sure, let's get your your, your, your carbs and fat in there to, to balance that, to get the nutrition you need to, uh, the energy you need to, um, to give you the, the energy need not to lose too much weight and, and to 
to, to perform your CrossFit workout or your workout that you need to achieve for. Um, yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, very, very exciting things mm-hmm. in real life. And it was a real buzz to see, you know, the theory come out in practice. Yeah, that's awesome. And there's, a, there's so much on your site for free. I mean, if I start a profile, <laughs> I can enter all of my, like everything that I'm already eating. One thing I think that's a big benefit of a Nutrient Optimizer versus USDA is that mm-hmm. USDA has a lot of information, a lot of information on uh, like dietary habits of Americans mm-hmm. in certain decades, but a lot of it is survey based. A lot of it's mm-hmm. recollection survey based. Your mm-hmm. data is direct input. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I do want to play a little bit of devil's advocate here. So I sure. admit this is going to be a diff- maybe a difficult question to answer, but sure. Uh, how would you answer this question? How mm-hmm. can I trust that a computer can tell me what to eat, especially a computer in the future? <laughs> <laughs> I think our servers are in Atlanta, so it's okay. But, uh, <laughs> okay. Sure. You're all good. End of story. Okay, um, well, I trust uh, it. You don't need to answer it anymore. Yeah, all good. Um, uh, uh, I suppose what we're doing is working out what works for most people most of the time. And, uh, you know, you, Everybody thinks they're a delicate petal and a unique snowflake, but um, you know most of us aren't really as, as special as we and, and unique as we think we are. So um, we've just tried to work out what works for most people most of the time, but then seg- segment them up into different populations, not just go, you know, everybody should go keto, everybody should go paleo, everybody should just do nutrient density. It's like, hey, what is your goal? And if your goal is... Um, lean bulking, then what are the foods that will help you do that um, to, to gain more muscle without too much fat? And if, if you're trying to balance your blood sugar, what are the, you know, how do you manipulate the insulin out of your diet without um, neglecting nutrient density too much, which is sort of a low carb keto approach? So, yeah, um, it's, it's, it's what we've shown with two major databases from half a million days of MyFitnessPal data and two hundred uh, sorry 25,000 days of, of chronometer data of what works for most people most of the time. And uh, yeah, in short, maybe you're um, practicing a vegan diet and, and you're getting a lot of plant-based materials in and you may not be as potassium deficient as most people, but um, and context does matter and your activity levels do matter, but, this, you know, we've defined what works for most people most of the time and there will be some variation within that because you are unique to some degree, but um, that's where we allow you to track your diet and say what are you actually getting and what are the foods that, and what are the micronutrients you're not getting enough of at the moment and therefore what foods and meals will help you fill those micronutrient gaps. And to me, that's just, you know, that's what nutrition should be. But um, somehow it's a new concept and I want to be part of getting it out there. So is it of your opinion that uh, people should be focusing mostly on micronutrients rather than macronutrients? Is there a hierarchy there or is it still just kind of even across the field? I, I, I'm just interested to hear your take based on the data you've seen. Yeah, um, all of the above, I think. Um, one thing we have found uh, up to about 45, 50% protein, micronutrient density is correlated with, with more protein. So, um, And in the reality is if you try to eat 50% of your diet from a protein, it's very, 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 very hard to maintain. Um, so with any, within any reasonable range, um, more protein tends to correlate with better micronutrient density even if you're not trying to worry it like we don't we only calculate we only track the uh, we only score based on the harder to find nutrients which are typically not the amino acids so it's more protein t- tends to correlate with more vitamins and minerals and essential fatty acids that most people find harder to obtain um so yeah macronutrients are important in that regard and balancing your blood sugars by manipulating how many how much carbohydrates you, you're eating so if your carbohydrate if your blood sugars are high you're a diabetic you need to titrate that down um, but then the next step is to dial in your, your micronutrient density which continue to take you further a lot further down that track than just tracking calories um, 
and it seems to just make a more sustainable, healthy diet. You can, like as you're inferring before, if you just go, if it fits your macros, you can create a fantastically nutritious, healthy diet with that or you can create complete pus that, you know, the manufacturers can fit their um, the thing they want to sell you within that parameter. But if you say, you know, show me the micronutrients from the food without the fortification, it's much harder to get through that criteria to, 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 to sell you crap and, and hoodwink you to buy things that aren't actually going to be healthy for you. Well, I, I read a book called The Dorito Effect. And I love, 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 love that. It's a beautiful book because it talks about the first thing we tried to make. One thing tastes like another thing. We made a chip taste like a taco. And yeah, I remember a specific study that they cited in there. You'll, you'll remember mm. it. It was when they took, I think, a bunch of goats and mm. they had a, a bunch of roughage that mm. they made uh, phosphorus deficient. Mm. And they had them eat it uh, for a period of time. And then they kept eating it. It was typically has phosphorus in it and they took it out mm. somehow and mm. they had them eat it. And then the amount of this roughage they ate increased threefold. Mm. And then they gave them some more roughage that had a natural phosphorus status and they maintained the overeating pattern mm. because I, and the theory was that their appetite increased mm. as nutrient status decreased mm. because even though they ate the same amount, the brain was still able, at least that was the theory, the brain is still able to detect it. You would eat it, you would expect that nutrient. And then when it wasn't there, the brain was still able to signal eat more. And it mm. wasn't about the quantity and the fullness and the actual volume of food it was about the nutrient status mm. and the expectation. So the theory is that if you mm. eat a taco flavored Dorito, Mm. And your brain is expecting meat, tomato, sour cream, stuff like that. And you just mm. eat this seasoning mix instead. Mm. Your brain eats it and there's a good volume of food. It might be 500 calories worth of chips. And then your brain says, I'm still not getting that lycopene and mm. all the mm. stuff I'm expecting from the taco. Keep eating, keep eating, mm. keep eating. Do you feel like, I guess the follow up there, and I'm, I'm getting this from you and I just wonder if you can elaborate is that when your nutrient status is optimal or mm. better. Mm. That the neurology of appetite begins to change and then the macros can tend to work out for themselves. You can start trusting your appetite for certain... Ma you, you can find your own yeah. macro ratios that you like when your appetite is regulated, but it can't be unless your nutrient status is optimal. I, I know that's a, <laughs> that's a really <laughs> long thought, but... but is that kind of the way that no, I, I'm seeing it I work? You said it well. Said it well. Um, yeah, the whole whole Dorito effect thing is fantastic. Um, Ted Naiman, a friend of mine, raves on about the uh, the protein leverage hypothesis, and there really does seem to be a similar sort of thing going on with the nutrient leverage hypothesis, where we continue to eat enough food until we get the the nutrients we need, as well as the protein. And I think from a you know. Um, uh, Stephen Guillenay talks about the, the hungry brain and how it's all, all happening in the brain. But to go back a step further, you've, you've, you've got to think that, you know, from an evolutionary historical point of view that the brain would have said, okay, I need protein and I, su I survive better when I get the protein I need. So I'm going to get a dopamine hit for getting that protein. And similarly, you'd get the dopamine hit for potassium and sodium and magnesium and, and everything else to some degree, but just influenced by the availability of those nutrients in the default food system and, and how much you're currently getting. So, you know, when you're, when you're eating salt, once you get enough salt and the body's replete with salt, you don't need any more. And, um, and, uh, so you don't, sorry, the sun just came in to say hi. <laughs> no problem. I, I can make, I can make a cut right here. And then, you know, can... no, uh, no, and, um, yeah. So once you've got enough sodium in your body, you, you uh, you don't, you get a real strong taste for sodium and it doesn't taste good anymore. But up until about four or five grams of sodium a day, you, uh, you, 
you still have an appetite for sodium and it drives you to eat more of those foods that contain a moderate amount of sodium. So, um, yeah, and that seems to be happening throughout the whole food system that you, you continue to crave foods until you get it. But like they talk about in, in the Dorito effect, um, all the nutrients in food, the smells uh, put out a, a sense of uh, a, 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 the, the based on the different vitamins and minerals and amino acids in those foods and uh, and they drive you to crave those things. But then we came up with the gas chromatograph that said, yeah, okay, we can mimic that, we can copy that flavour and, and put it into food because our food no longer actually contains those nutrients because, as I said before, we've, we've worked out how to use all these fertilisers to grow crops quickly and for size and, and productivity and, and profit, but they no longer contain the flavour you need in them uh, naturally because they don't contain the nutrients. So, um, yeah, the hacking flavour um, is just an incredible risk um, nutritionally that, that we no longer can trust and associate the, 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 how food tastes with how good it is actually for us. So I suppose that that's where looking from a micronutrient density point of view, you can then say, is it, does it really contain the things we need in those foods um, beyond what it, what it tastes like? So, I mean, the whole Beyond Burger and fake meat thing recently, everything I've read just so you know, oh, it tastes okay. And it tastes okay because they've had teams of scientists working for decades to try and mimic the taste mm -hmm. of meat with synthetic, um, you know, it tastes good because it's got um, uh, the nutritional yeast and monosodic sodium glutamate in there and a whole lot of artificial, you know, they call them natural flavours, but they're just artificial flavours. But, um, you know, you, once we start hacking our flavour sensation that has evolved to tell us what foods are actually good for us, we're in a, we're in a lot of trouble. It's kind of like a, a form of mind control, kind of like... <laughs> Yeah, not kind of like when Marty just stuck out his hand and just did a Jedi mind control <laughs> to his son. Stop. <laughs> yeah. He's a Jedi, a Jedi master. Yeah. Not, not only does he live in the future and know everything that's going to happen, but he can also control it. You think it happens regularly? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a laser just stopped him in his tracks. I, as two fathers, we can really appreciate yes. that, and we need to spend a lot of extra time with you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I can teach you the skills. <laughs> over time, yeah, yeah. over time, That's we great. will be patient. <laughs> Quick question with a lot of the data you've been collecting. Did you, have you found out that like um, a lot of whatever's being said in society or on TV, like nutrient deficiencies will happen because of that, like salt. Like a lot of people are probably not, like salt isn't, like the sodium isn't as bad for you as a lot of people think, mm. unless you have certain mm. issues, right? But salt's bad for you, salt's bad for you. So, you, you know, people are probably under eating their sodium and everything like that. And then mm. with the sodium and iodine, like then is their iodine, mm. like the iodine salt, like then is their iodine low, which then has other yeah. issues and stuff like that. So is it like very social media, like, big stream media like base with a lot of like the deficiencies that you've seen or is it kind of all over the map? Yeah, um, you can get into wonderful conspiracy theories. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, going back, you look at the, the, the way our food system has become much more agricultural based more and more with, you know, it's very cost effective to use the chemical fertilizers, which I'm um, completely recently came across some um, a book, Profits and Wizards, that goes through, you know, the impact of chemical fertilisers that completely blew my mind of how impactful that was. But um, that was back in the 1930s. But uh, food just came became so much easier to produce quickly using that technology. Uh, ever since then, a whole messaging uh, from the US Department of Agriculture, who's mission it is to promote the foods of agriculture that America produces. Yeah, it's in um, the, yeah, that's in the mission, you're right. That is, that is their mission, as much as I use all the data in, in my analysis, but uh, that, that is their mission to promote the foods of agriculture. Um, there's, there's been a departure in the messaging away from, uh, you know, 
whole foods and, and animal based foods and you know the US the nineteen seventy seven US DA guidelines that started to say cholesterol is bad and fat is bad and saturated as fat is bad sort of uh, precipitated that and accelerated that. And you, uh, from that point, with the micronutrient density, you see vitamin A dropping and B12 dropping mm-hmm. around that point where they created this fear around animal based foods. And um, I mean, one thing with the chronometer data, you see that there is a, a like potassium is number one as far as the micronutrients. Um, cholesterol is number two in mm-hmm. terms okay. of. Our appetite for cholesterol, we really go ballistic for foods that contain more cholesterol up to a point and then it flattens out. So it seems that we're all um, cholesterol deficient dietarily, that if we we ate more foods that contain cholesterol, um, we'd be more satiated and eat less. And, uh, you know, that's not the same for all fat. Uh, as yeah. I said before, yes. beyond about 60% fat, it starts to rocket up. And But but it seems we, we need more cholesterol. Um I can't mimic the same thing for omega-3 because we're probably getting enough omega-3 and heaps of omega-6 in our diet with all the, the seed oils. Mm. But cholesterol, vitamin A, B12, all those sort of things seem to have plummeted as a result of that messaging of, a, of an anti-animal-based thing. But we see pe- people are craving them as they get more of them. They're, they're satiated and they don't need to eat as much, which um, you know, I think is really important. Mm-hmm. What's a what's a major change that you've made personally since you've started this? How do you use the nutrient optimizer and the information that you're seeing? Or are you just a pizza and wings guy still? Stay six percent body fat. <laughs> no biggest. I just stay, stay at home and eat donuts and <laughs> Um, no, it, it, it's really hard to live in the real world and, and, and go to the markets and shop. And we, we, as a family, we invest a lot of our money in, in food for uh, fourteen and fifteen year old kids and, uh, and 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 the wife and the who who don't care about graphs, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> fourteen and fifteen year old kids are not big fans of data. Well, my my, my, my son is a bit of a data nerd. Amazing, oh, he's trying good. to do artificial intelligence programming all this <laughs> wacky stuff that's way above my head. And I go, oh, I can see so much of myself in you, but uh, probably harder uh, to mind control him. <laughs> that one gives you a little kickback. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, no, they, they, they've grown up in the middle of it all, so it's been interesting. But they, they really notice the difference between what they eat at home and what the other people eat. And occasionally, we have indulgences to make ourselves look sure. uh, normal, and and we don't always be completely zealous about it all. But um, yeah, definitely, um, I try to prioritize protein as much as I can in 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 my life. Um, uh, to, to maximize satiety, um, is, uh, we get kangaroo over here, and I'm a I'm a sucker for kangaroo, um, which is really nutrient dense and high protein, um, as much as uh, veggies and, and and everything as I can. A, a good chunk of spinach, but not too much because you know spinach is not the only thing, and you get oxalate issues to some degree, and uh, you can only handle so much spinach. So you need to rotate your your veggies. Um, I came across a crocodile the other day, which is completely fascinating. And you dive into the nutrient density of this effectively an apex predator and the nutrient density is completely off the chart. And you go, okay, I understand how it works here. It's, it's you know, that these, uh, you can understand how wild animals in the past would have been incredibly nutrient dense and we wouldn't have to have worried about any of this um, micronutrient density stuff. So yeah, um, it, it's, it's a daily thing and I try to, um, live it as much as I can and, and uh, while I'm trying to maintain a day job and, and a pretty full on hobby all at the same time. Do you ever feel starstruck when you see a really nutrient dense food that you've always <laughs> wanted to see? Like I've seen you on my list, watercress and I finally. <laughs> well, that was what I felt with, um, with the crocodile. I went, wow, I don't know if this is the, uh, you know, seeing the nutrient density, but it tastes so good and I feel so good and I feel so happy after I had this crocodile. This is incredible. So, you know, it's not, not cheap and hard to get. I'm not sure whether we can all live on crocodile sustainably for the rest of eternity, but anyway. Have you noticed any difference with your kids since you started this like lifestyle change in your household, like grade wise or like yeah, attention um, deficit disorder, anything like if they had anything or yeah, great question. Um, the, the, the daughter used to be uh, a lot, uh, you know, 
she was a bit of a moody, angry kid until we got her off grains and she really settled down and she had really bad gut pain. Um, I think just the autoimmune thing flows mm-hmm. in the family and the, the son definitely goes, um, you know, food colourings and flavourings. He definitely responds to those. So if we try to keep those out of his life, um, yeah, he'll just sit down with a block of cheese and hammer <laughs> through it as, as a pre-breakfast snack these days. <laughs> You go, what are you eating? You're eating so much, but uh, you know that's the other thing. You've, you've got to work out how do you feed these kids in a in a in a healthy way. Um, yeah, because you can't go. All you can eat is the the spinach and watercress and 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 kangaroo because you know that they're growing and they're growing really quickly. So it's the, just, just the differentiation of nutrient density, nutrition for different people with different goals is fascinating. Even in with my own family, between myself, who's trying to get stronger and stay lean, and the wife with diabetes and the kids who are growing like weeds. So yeah, that's cool. Would you consider yourself a foodie? Because I, I know not everyone that's into nutrition is also into food. You know, like the, uh, you know, the, the higher quality five star, do you, are you a big cook or are you just kind of a basic like you're in college? And, uh, you know, like we ask each other this kind of stuff all the time that I'm, I'm very into the, the biochemistry stuff. And I, I wasn't in high school, but now I am because I can see the the reasoning and rationale behind it. But there is part of me, there's 10% of me, this man's versus food. You know, like I like a good challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, are you a foodie? Do you like ch- food challenge? Are you kind of a man versus food guy or do you have a, oh. a pretty low key, even consistent diet? Yeah. Yeah. The, the wife is a great cook. So together we're, we're great. I tell her ah, that cook the numbers and uh, yeah, she, she creates amazing food for the family. Um, if it was me, I'd just be going, here's your, protein powder and kangaroo and spinach and that'll, that'll be all you need. Um, I'm, I'm much simpler when it comes to that. And I find simplicity, you know, you get, um, I talk about sensory specific satiety. If, if you're eating a whole variety of things all the time, it's just, you know, there's that colored cookie and there's that flavored cookie. And the, you know, the, you just keep on having to try everything and eat more and more things. So the simpler you can eat, most of the time, the better. But yeah, definitely need to enjoy food, and um, good food should taste good. And unfortunately, most of our food doesn't taste good without a bit of help from all the flavorings and colorings we were talking about before. Yeah, yeah, and there's there's definitely a social aspect of food that you know we can't forget that mm. you know we we can get heavy into the nutrition, and I think it's yeah, extraordinarily yeah. important. But you know, there's I think two really good rules. I can't remember where I heard this. Maybe I made it up, but you know the two really good rules of diet was eat food that doesn't hurt you and don't be weird. You know, <laughs> don't and, be weird. yeah, yeah. I like that. I like yeah. don't be evil, don't be weird. But um, yeah, I think that the quality of what you're eating is is, is worth investing in, and uh, food that food that you know is nutritious will taste amazing. And we went down to a a winery, the wife wanted to do a winery tour last weekend. And um, the first one we stopped at 11 o'clock in the morning tasting wines. It was quite a weird experience. We've got on bikes and rode around. But um, <laughs> the one that completely blew our mind was this, you know, it had been grown with 60-year-old vines with no irrigation on volcanic soil and the, the roots had to go all the way down. And the, the nutrients that sucked up, it was this amazing taste and just completely blew your mind that... Um, uh, that these natural, uh, the, the, the synthetic flavors and colorings could never mimic. Um, yeah, so it's like, okay, now I understand nutrition in a whole new way because these wine vines, uh, these grape vines are sucking up all this amazing nutrition and making these things taste completely off the chart. So you can't really um, synthetically copy incredible nutrition. You have to go out of your way to find good food and buy it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the five-star food that I was quoting, you'll never find a five-star chef using synthetic stuff. It's totally. all whole food. Yeah, <laughs> Let's, put in, more color. Let's <laughs> put in more colors and, 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 and sauce and yeah, it doesn't happen that way. It's the, it's the natural ingredients. It tastes amazing. Yeah. Um, so what, what barriers have you set up from for yourself to prevent burnout in this Cause you've been working hard and like the website and everything and just keep adding on. So what, oh, what have wow. you put in place in your life? Like some um, guardrails to make sure you don't I've, go careening off the road. I've been tracking heart rate variability for a while. 
okay. um, which has been fascinating. And um, recently got the aura ring, okay. which uh, I've been trying to tame and it confuses the hell out of me and it's really challenging. And um, I'll find I'll, I'll get in and, and do a, a heavy workout because I really want to work out. So I'll, I'll, I'll lift heavy, but then the heart rate will be elevated overnight and or, or and, and then you get hungry so you'll eat more at night. So then the next morning you wake up going, I really, you know, I ate too much and you'd go work out again. So it's this cycle and um and then you don't sleep as well. And uh so yeah, it's it's definitely a challenge, I suppose, just finding that place to, to back off and and uh not always be going full on. Um yeah, but at the same time, the whole nutrition thing is, is my hobby, and, and it's sort of like the the uh, the balance between the day job and, and, and I have a lot of fun doing nutrition. But I think if I did the nutrition thing full time, it would become my job and a whole lot more stressful and not as much fun. So they sort of balance each other out, and just make sure I get time to to be active and go for a walk with the dog and the wife to the park and see sun and. Uh, and at lunchtime, I've um, you know got into a habit of getting out and going for a walk around the city for an hour, listening to podcasts, and just making sure I'm active and seeing the sun. I think that's the biggest challenge for me is trying to get that, um, the 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 the, the cycle, uh, managing sleep through getting adequate light during the day, not always being looking at blue light, and uh, and not always being over stimulated with caffeine and the like which i really enjoy that's my that's my jam if i have a choice i'll, I'll go the uh the, the, the caffeine rather than the alcohol but uh, uh and but being able to find downtime and sleep and rest and all that as well and not burning out and um yeah i'm trying to get to a point where i can take a bit a bit more time off to to invest in this to to make it more mainstream because it just seems to be it'd be a waste if i got to 10 years down the track and i didn't get this out to more people. So trying to continue to refine the message and simplify it and get it out to more people. Well, any, any way we can be a part of that. We're very happy to, to help well, in any way. You. Thank um, you. Appreciate, appreciate, I, I love it when people like you guys, you know, you know, have never interacted with it. I don't think on Facebook too much and uh, you're not, not part of the community as such, but have obviously read stuff and gone, I get it, I understand it, I see why this is important and interact on a meaningful level. And that's the biggest thrill and compliment that it obviously resonates with people. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's a real buzz. So thank you. Well, I want to ask you one more question then I'm going to let you go. And this is cool. one that, this one we ask all guests. So if you don't have a you know, a particular answer. I didn't ask you this one before and it, cause I want an honest answer. And if you don't have one, that's totally fine too. But the, given the fact mm-hmm. that you are somebody that's obviously very dedicated to what you do, um, motivations, not an issue. You're very yep. curious. Seems like you're yep. doing, you know, a lot of the right things and you're a family man. Responsibilities are at an all time high probably in your life right now. What is one tradition that you have with your family or one um one thing that you found that you do with your family that has made the quality of life in your family better whether that's we always go for a walk we always sit down at the dinner table i don't see them at all i don't know what's (laughs) what's the what's the answer for you in the kindle family that's one thing you have you guys have going Uh, well, we you give them high speed internet, and we're all happy. Just <laughs> 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 that's the secret to happiness. <laughs> but, but, but if the internet goes out, they, they all come out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you people? Why is that? <laughs> Who are you? How did before? these kids end up in my house? <laughs> um, but 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 slightly more seriously, um, walk walk with the family and the dog in the park. Uh, with, with not not the. Uh, mainly the wife, uh, the kids don't come for walks with us anymore. Um, we we often go to the markets on the weekend and, and get good food, and uh, you know have a have a Saturday night or a Sunday night dinner that's like oh wow this food is amazing and um, really enjoy the good food. Um, and we've always done this cuddle regime that uh, you know, the kids jump into bed and we have a bit of a chat at night and the daughter at 15 still does that and loves to come in and blah, 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 and chat, 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 chat. And that, that's really um, a really nice tradition, I think, to, to, they still want to do that and still have a chat and share their day and download and, and that's really therapeutic and, 
and uh, usually uh, sends me off to sleep quite effectively as well. <laughs> so really, uh, but I do really enjoy that and having that relationship is really important. Yeah. yeah, sense of security, sense of uh, it's just mm. very comforting when people mm-hmm. can actually still interact face to face now. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, very cool, awesome. very cool. Well, I I can't thank you enough. Uh, I'm gonna send you a follow up email on this any way that we sure. can be a part of Nutrient Optimizer going forward. <laughs> um, I'm using it with my clients right now, and oh, it's wow. my hope that there are some people listening. We'll share it with all of our groups. I want you to share it with yours, and I hope there's more people we can reach that can get involved in. Uh, everything that you're doing and I know it can help in a big yeah, well, way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. So what's uh, real quick, what's next challenge for the nutrient optimizer? Uh, you um, did fat loss, you did the yeah. nutrition density. Yeah. Well, I suppose the next challenge I'm, I'm going through, I've, I've um, looked at all the different micronutrients, um, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and doing a bit of a, you know, a, a dump on that to teach people on why that's important going through all the different conditions of, you know, PMS, fibromyalgia, all these different sort of conditions and how different nutrients can help and then designing uh, food lists and meal lists and recipes and a bit of a protocol that can help people work through those issues with nutrition from a very, um, you know, I'm very new to this and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm just dipping my toe in before they dive fully into the nutrient optimizer into the deep end to once they're sold out to, to optimize their micronutrient level at, at, at the, to the nth degree. So we're just trying to develop that, uh, that funnel from one end to the other to help nice. people go through that process. So, yeah, hopefully that'll be the next thing we roll out and then we can um, make it, you know, put, a, put a price tag on it. To all, at yeah. the moment it's all, all being free and then I can devote even more time to it, which would be great. Yeah, awesome. That's fantastic. Well, This has been the Inward Investing Podcast. I'm Mike Ritter. I'm Todd Wallen. And thank you very much, Marty, for your time. I'm confused. Should I tell them goodbye tomorrow? Because it is tomorrow. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Well, I'm going to sit and think about this. Good yesterday (laughs) to us, and we have to say good tomorrow to him. (laughs) 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 My my, my mind just blew up. Thank you, Todd. (laughs)